Hello, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the Science Salon podcast. I'm your host, Michael Shermer, and I bring you this show from California once a week as part of the larger mission of the Skeptic Society to promote science and reason and to ensure that sound scientific viewpoints are heard worldwide. As a 501c3 nonprofit, we rely heavily on the ongoing and generous patronage of listeners like you. To pledge your support, please visit our website at skeptic.com slash donate. Thank you. My guest for this week is Robert Zubrin, the great uh, space flight engineer and aerodynamics engineer and so on. His new book is The Case for Space, How the Revolution in Space Flight Opens Up a Future of Limitless Possibility. I read uh, some portions from the book uh, in the podcast. So here, just let me say a few words about Robert himself. He is the president of Pioneers Astronautics and president of the Mars Society. For many years, he worked as a senior engineer for Lockheed Martin. In addition, he's the author of many critically acclaimed books, including Mars Direct, How to Live on Mars, The Case for Mars, Entering Space, Mars on Earth, Energy Victory, Merchants of Despair, and the science fiction novels The Holy Land and First Landing. He's also written for Scientific American, The New Atlantis, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Mechanical Engineering, and The American Enterprise. He's appeared on major media, including CNN, C-SPAN, BBC, Discovery Channel, NBC, ABC, and NPR. The book is great. I really enjoyed it. As I mentioned in the podcast, I had read his book, um, Entering Space, 20 years ago while on a long drive through the desert, and, and I did the same thing here. Uh, while on a recent vacation, and uh, and it's just something about being away from work and home and going in a new place and reading about going into space. So uh, a lot's happened in 20 years in terms of the entrepreneurial efforts to get us to Mars, thanks largely to Elon Musk, and so we start there, and then build out from there, um, talking about how we can become a Type 1, Type 2, and Type 3 civilization in the way Robert has configured that um, uh, that kind of matrix of our, of our long-term future. Um, I think it's all doable if technologically and scientifically, if it's possible socially, politically, economically, and so on. I think the social problems, political problems are, are as daunting as the technological and scientific ones. So we get into all of that, including uh, how to govern Mars, what kind of a government you'd want on Mars, something I've been working on myself a little bit. And, um, and also talking about past explorations of the Earth and what that tells us about human nature and the future of humanity. We talk about the Drake equation and where is everybody if there's extraterrestrials out there and how we might look, the origins of life and how common that might be um, in space, on other planets, and so on. Uh, just a, an amazing conversation, super interesting guy. I give you Robert Zubrin. Robert Zubrin, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for inviting me. Congratulations on the new book, The Case for Space. I have to tell you, I read this on a family vacation in uh, uh, Cancun, Yucatan Peninsula last week. And 20 years ago, on another family vacation, driving across the desert to Sedona, I read your Entering Space book. I realized how inspiring it was for both of those to be out, out in the middle of nowhere where it's hot and thinking it would be cool to go to another planet. <laughs> And I have to say, you, you are one of the more inspiring uh, science writers and, and scientists I've encountered since perhaps Sagan. I'm going to start uh, by reading the final uh, paragraphs of your book, and then we'll go back to the beginning to see how we're going to get to here. So here's how you conclude this, this uh, inspiring work. Our distant kin followed the stars to the north. Later, as humans became seafaring, it was the stars again, with poetic truth, the North Star, that gave us the guidance we needed to become a truly global species. Today, the stars beckon again, this time not to new continents, but to new solar systems. Multitudes of new worlds yet unknown await, filled with menaces to be faced, challenges to be overcome, wonders to be discovered, and history to be made. The first chapter of the human saga has been written, but vast volumes lying out among the stars are still blank, ready for the pens of new peoples with new thoughts, new tongues, astonishing creations, and epic deeds. 
It is a grand time to be alive. We are young. The universe is in its spring, and the door has been opened, inviting us outside to meet the dawn of the greatest adventure ever. Ad Astra. <laughs> That's beautiful writing, Robert. You are just such an inspiring writer. So tell us, how are we going to get there? <laughs> well, um, you know, all of human history up till now has been our transformation from a local species in the Kenyan Rift Valley to a global species and uh, a global civilization, not really uh, global in extent, but unified globally with the capacity to uh, um, access the resources of a planet. Um, now we're beginning the next chapter of human history to what uh, I call um, type two uh, civilization, which is one that has access to the resources of its solar system, which then puts you in position to go for type three, which is an interstellar civilization. The key step right now, the reason why uh, I believe that future ages will regard this as uh, the beginning of history in almost the same sense as we today regard the trek out of Africa as the beginning of history, um, is um, well, it's happening now, and the thing that's setting it loose is this entrepreneurial space revolution. Okay, um, we, um, in the first decade or so of the space age, uh, NASA and its Soviet counterparts achieved immense things. They were racing to the moon. They developed the full array of space technologies, more or less, that have um, enabled us to uh, reach the moon, send probes to the planets, and so forth, uh, launch space telescopes. Um, and we've exploited those in the uh, half century since. But for 40 years after the moon landing, the price of space launch didn't fall. It stayed flat. And yet, in the last 10 years, it has fallen by a factor of five. And uh, this uh, has been due uh, largely to uh, SpaceX, um, which has not only done that, not only introduced some cheaper launch systems and, and so forth, um, but they have demonstrated a principle, which is that it is possible for a well-led entrepreneurial team to do things that previously it was thought that only the governments of major powers could do. And not only that, do it in one third the time for one tenth the cost or less and even do things that they had deemed impossible altogether, such as making reusable launch vehicles that could fly back to the pad and land there instead of just crashing into the ocean. And um, this is setting the age, uh, the, this is setting the stage for a new age of discovery. And this capability is already being exploited by NASA Science Directorate, which launched the Test Space Telescope with a Falcon 9, uh, saving itself $200 million to spend on more telescopes. Um, <laughs> instead of a much more expensive launcher, um, but also even for um, the space settlement. Um, and because Musk has succeeded at this, he, he demonstrated this principle, others are getting into the game. Um, there are emulators of his own type, uh, Jeff Bezos with the, uh, Blue Origin and Richard Branson with the Virgin Galactic, but it has gone beyond billionaires with discretionary money. Uh, there are now working engineers, people of middle class means who have gotten 100 million, 200 million, 300 million dollars of investment and are creating their own low cost launch systems. And like Rocket Lab, which has reached orbit, okay, 300 million dollars of investment. And this is a New Zealand company. New Zealand doesn't even have a space program. So the entrepreneurial space revolution has opened the door to participation of people of every nation because you don't need a national consensus uh, to launch an entrepreneurial company. You just need uh, a few investors and, and uh, some technological know-how. But, but so, to be clear, you, you endorse both government and private enterprise. You don't think private alone could do it. Uh, that's correct. Um, I think that to take, for example, um, the very important uh, uh, achievement of the first human missions to Mars. Okay. Uh, Elon Musk is rapidly developing um, major parts of the hardware set required to do that. Uh, but he does not want to do this whole thing out of pocket. I think what he's doing, I mean, he's developing this craft called the Starship. It's, it's not a Starship like the Enterprise that flies to stars. This is just the name. Uh, but what it is, it's a fully reusable two-stage heavy lift launch vehicle. And um, and while they have projections, Musk is always very optimistic that this will be flying to Mars in three years. 
2022. I, I, I doubt that, but I do think it will be flying to Earth orbit by 2024. And what this is going to do is it's going to change the math so that whoever is elected president in 2024, and he or she asks their advisors, could I have humans to Mars by the end of my second term? With Starship already flying at that point, the answer is going to be yes. Mm. But will it cost hundreds of billions of dollars? No. It might cost $10 billion. Well, then we should do this. Okay. In other words, this is lowering the cost threshold, the schedule threshold, the risk threshold to the point where uh, this will become sellable to the political class. And so we're going to have a public-private partnership on this and uh, where the entrepreneurs are creating the means to make this doable and sustainable um, within uh, reasonable budgets and extremely capable within reasonable budgets. Now, you and I came of age, and you're about my age, I think, uh, the 60s, we grew up with the Apollo, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo mission, and and uh, Verna von Braun was was talking about colonizing Mars and all that. How come it didn't happen? Uh, in, well, we had a major failure of political leadership in the United States uh, in the Nixon administration. That is, um, you know, NASA did have plans to have a moon base by the mid 70s and land on Mars by 1981 and have a permanent Mars base by 1988. And they could have done it. If we had continued at a Apollo level of effort, we would have that. And the first children uh, born on Mars would probably be graduating uh, uh, high school from Mars uh, this June. Um, <laughs> you know, that's where we'd be. But we didn't, that was the path not taken. Um, and I mean, it was like Ferdinand and Isabella welcoming Columbus back from the New World the first time and saying, so what? What's this? What do we care about this? Go away. OK. And uh, and abandoning it. So that was the path not taken. And unfortunately, without a clear and bold uh, uh, goal and direction, NASA, um, well, in particular, the human spaceflight program, ceased to be mission driven or purpose driven. Uh, the science program remained largely purpose-driven, which is why it has accomplished a lot in the intervening half century. But the human spaceflight program, without a clear objective, became vendor-driven. Uh, it became uh, primarily important as a means of distributing funds to various contractors. Uh, I mean, this was perceived as a way of keeping the team that had been built for Apollo in being, maintaining these centers, maintaining these things, but without a driving goal. So. Um, it became much uh, more wasteful in terms of funds. It became much less schedule driven. When you're purpose driven, you're schedule driven. Apollo was certainly schedule driven. That's why it succeeded. Um, the the uh, and and the best people left. The best people left uh, NASA. And also, I would have to say uh, that this problem goes beyond NASA. That there's been a deterioration in the quality of the political class in the United States since the 1960s. The, the political class we had in the 1960s were in many cases the same people or the younger brothers of the people that won World War II. And they knew how to pull together to accomplish great projects, whether it was winning the war, Manhattan Project, the interstate highway system, going to the moon. Um, they knew how to do that. And instead, um, um, that generation uh, left and a different kind uh, um, took their place. And uh, so without a competent political class and with a, a significantly degraded NASA, this became an ever more remote uh, 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 possibility. But precisely as a result of this uh, system failure, uh, a solution came into being, which was the entrepreneurs. We started seeing this in the 90s. By then, people were starting to get frustrated. You know, in the 70s, you could still believe that this was just going to start again, that what we've seen was a temporary uh, halt. But but by the 90s now, 30 years had gone by. I said, what is going on here? Uh, and initially, uh, many of these efforts were undercapitalized. But by 2001, a person had been recruited to the vision who did have um, both the uh, talent and the resources to actually do this. And that was Musk. And shortly after that, Bezos and uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, Branson and so forth. And so uh, this has now, uh, a, a new principle of action has been let loose. And I think one that's ultimately more potent than national competition, which is entrepreneurial competition, more creative, 
Um, and, um, and the cats are out of the bag because, you know, okay, Musk himself, um, he, he has, deserves the greatest credit for making this happen, but he could fail. Musk is a risk taker. Musk skates close to the edge of the ice. Anyone who <laughs> observe his activity, mm -hmm. you have to say, you know, my God, uh, does it all depend on Musk? Well, at one point it did. Uh, at this point, of course, if, if Musk did fail, uh, that would set back the prospects for human to Mars by perhaps a decade. But it wouldn't stop it because he's made his point. He's made his point. And if he should drop the flag, others will pick up the banner. I think that's true because it's the same, same thing with the uh, electric car uh, business. Now that uh, he's brought it online and it's cool to have a, you know, a sexy, fast, uh, far-driving electric car, everybody else is doing it now. So even if Tesla goes out of business, you know, BMW, Ford, GM, they're all going to have or already have viable electric cars that go 300 miles and, and, and are fun to drive and so on. I think the cat's out of the bag there, too. So I think you're right on that. Uh, but let's go back just a little bit back to the 60s again and your own inspiration and maybe give us a little uh, biographical uh, encapsulation of, of what inspired you. I met you in the 90s and you had your Mars Direct program and your and your book on Mars. And I thought, this is it. It's going to happen. And yet it does really sometimes take somebody like a a Kennedy who, uh, you know, rallies the nation, even if it's for political reasons or a Musk for entrepreneurial reasons to get it going. Yeah, well, okay. Um, well, I was actually five when Sputnik flew. Mm. And um, and I can remember it. It's the first big time world event that I can actually remember in terms of my personal experience. And while Sputnik may have been terrifying to the adults, to me, it was just great. Uh, <laughs> I loved it. Uh, because I was an early reader. I was already reading science fiction. And uh, what Sputnik said to me was that the stories I was reading about the spacefaring future were going to be true. It was This was going to happen. And so uh, I learned all the science I could, and my parents did uh, support that interest. My father got me a telescope, and I did drawings of the moon through the eyepiece and all of that, and launched rockets. I, I did the whole thing. I was one of the Apollo kids. And uh, I was nine when Kennedy gave his speech, committing the nation. I was 17 when we landed on the moon. And um, so I was one to be on board. But then I was in college in the early 70s. And in that very same period, the whole thing was collapsing. And um, so I did uh, uh, something practical. OK. Also, I mean, the real world, so-called, got to me and said, look, it's OK to think you're going to be a space explorer when you're 12. OK. But. You know, in the real world, people have jobs like lawyers and accountants and teachers and so forth. And what do you want to be? So I became a science teacher and um, I did that for about seven years. Um, but then, you know, I was teaching in Brooklyn and living in northern Manhattan and commuting an hour and 15 minutes each way on the A train and reading novels by Herman Melville about sailing the South Seas and saying, what am I doing here? OK, now being a science teacher is a noble profession. Um, you know, I, I have no regrets, but it wasn't what I wanted to be when I was 12. Mm. Okay. And I decided I was going to be that. So I went back to graduate school and while I was in graduate school, I heard about the activities of a group of people who were called the Mars underground, uh, who were a number of people of my own generation, people like Chris McKay, Penelope Boston. He's now a scientist at NASA Ames. She's leading the uh, NASA Astrobiology Institute. Carol Stoker is also at Ames right now, who also basically were not willing to accept this idea that humans to Mars were the dreams of youth and now what the space program is about was launching weather satellites. And they had held a number of conferences called The Case to, for Mars. Uh, I went to the third one and it was incredible. I mean, Carl Sagan was there. Tom Paine, who was the NASA administrator when we landed on the moon was there. There was tremendous excitement. We can make this possible. I was all in. And uh, that's also where I met uh, Ben Clark, who was uh, a leader at Martin Marietta of their Mars mission studies. And I made contact with him and that eventually led to my employment there doing preliminary design of, of Mars missions. And uh, and from there, the rest is uh, history, because then I designed the Mars Direct Plan, published the case for Mars, and so on. And the Mars Society, your, your yes. nonprofit. 
and and are, what are you working on now besides your books uh, in terms of well, uh, engineer, engineering? I stayed at Martin for seven years uh, doing both uh, preliminary design of, of interplanetary missions, but also it became clear to me at that time that the key to the human Mars mission was the ability to make propellant on Mars. Um, and that more broadly, the key to human space settlement was the ability to take local materials on other worlds and turn them into resources. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. I don't believe there's any such thing as natural resources anywhere. I think there's only natural raw materials. It is resourceful people that turn materials into resource. This is a key point. But anyway, uh, so um, I led an effort at, at Martin Marietta, which then became Lockheed Martin, uh, to demonstrate the ability to make propellants and oxygen on Mars. And these were uh, successful experiments. And um, so after doing that for a number of years, I decided to uh, specialize in that. And uh, Lee, I left Martin to start my own company, Pioneer Astronautics, in 1996, uh, which is still in business. I'm speaking to you from our office right now. Uh, we've won over 70 NASA contracts uh, covering a, a wide array of areas, propulsion, life support, et cetera. But, but local resource creation uh, is uh, been our forte. I think in that field we are. Uh, perhaps the leader in other fields were participant. I think we need to, to, to bore into that just a little bit because the idea is that if you have to take everything with you, then you have to pay for that in fuel, which is very expensive because you have to haul it all there. Your idea is that you make it when you get there and you just take what you need to get there. Therefore, you use far less propellant. Now, in your book, you have the whole formula. Just walk us through how you calculate the pa dollars per pound that you need to lift off from Earth and so forth. Well, Okay, now, of course, the uh, logistic cost of transport from Earth is coming down uh, as a result of the success of SpaceX. Over the past 10 years, it's fallen from 10,000 a kilogram to 2,000 a kilogram. But that's still vastly more than, uh, you know, air transport on Earth. Okay, <laughs> that's a lot more than FedEx charges. And even if we cut it by another factor of 10, which I think can be done and will be done, uh, it's $200 a kilogram. That's still... 10 times uh, air transport costs right now. Um, and of course, most things on Earth are not transported by air. They're transported by ship, rail, or truck. Um, so it's always going to be extremely beneficial to be able to make what you need on other worlds. Because, in fact, going to Mars is um, more costly than going to Earth orbit only about a, th a third uh, at most of what you deliver to Earth orbit ends up getting delivered to Mars uh, because of the propellant needed to push it there. Um, so look, um, you know, uh, people on Mars are not gonna wanna import their food from Earth, okay? That would be absurd. Mm -hmm. And people on Mars are not gonna wanna import their propellant from Earth. Uh, and any, or their steel from Earth. Anything that is um, a bulk material that weighs a lot, but which is relatively simple in its structure, such as propellants, food, um, plastics, metals, glass, uh, fiberglass, um, these things should be made on Mars. Now, there are certain things that for quite a while we're probably going to have to import for Earth. In other words, you could probably make the glass for the greenhouse on Mars, but what about the uh, computer chips that control the automated machinery that runs the greenhouse? That, for a while, you're going to have to import from Earth. But that's only a tiny percentage of the mass of the greenhouse. So, um, and, and that's how it should be done. So in the Mars Direct Plan, which is my plan for human Mars missions, we take the first step, which is making the return propellant on Mars, because that is the heaviest thing by far that you would have to deliver to Mars. That weighs much more than the spacecraft, the food, the water, anything. Second after that is water, which we now know we can make on Mars, okay? And even with uh, strong recycling, that will still be heavier than the spacecraft, okay? And in our initial Mars missions, that'll do it, okay? But ultimately, if you're talking about a Mars settlement, uh, you're gonna want to cut what you make on Mars by another factor of uh, what, what you have to bring to Mars by another factor of 100 or so, by making things like steel, glass, plastic, uh, food, um, 
and so forth. It, so you it do needs, this needs before, to be readily done. You do this before you send people there to make sure it's done. Well, um, the in the Mars Direct plan, uh, as I envision it, we do it with two launches of a heavy lift booster. The first shoots off to Mars, the Earth return vehicle, which travels to Mars along with a reactor to provide power and the uh, propellant making uh, a setup, which is built into the landing stage of, of the Earth return vehicle, and it makes its propellant to come home. Once that's done, then we can shoot the crew out to Mars in a Habitat spacecraft and land them on Mars near the Earth return vehicle. They use that as their house on Mars while they explore Mars for a year and a half, get additional things running like greenhouses and so forth, but we don't have the initial missions depend upon local food. Um, but the but then they fly back. They leave the reactor, the habitat, the greenhouses, all that uh, operating on Mars. Then you each mission adds another habitat to the base, more greenhouses and so forth. And uh, pretty soon uh, you've got the beginning of a human settlement on a new world. There, there's nothing in this that is beyond our technology. Now, Musk has embraced uh, many of the key ideas of this plan. He has this vehicle called the Starship that runs on methane oxygen engines, which is the propellant combination we can most readily make on Mars, and it's a very good propellant combination. Uh, now, he wants to send the Starship all the way to Mars, refuel it there, and send it back. I wouldn't do that. I would just use it as a fully reusable Earth-to-orbit vehicle and have it throw payloads to Mars. Because if you keep it in Earth orbit, you could use it again a few days later. If you send it all the way to Mars and back, it's three years before you could use it again. Um, and also, it's a rather big thing to have to refuel on Mars. That would put a large uh, logistic burden on the base. But the basic idea is the same. Um, but what his ideas do not include, and what my ideas do not include, is doing things like building lunar orbit space stations as uh, uh, basing points on the way to Mars. They're not needed. They're not wanted. They would add greatly to the complexity of the mission and the propellant requirements and all that. that that's a make work program. Um, and uh, so uh, the current NASA plan, which includes such things, um, is not really a plan to send humans to the Mars and is only arguably a plan to send people to the moon. Um, yeah, I never understood that one because you'd have to get to the moon and then slow down and land and then relaunch again to Mars. Uh, that never made sense to me. Whose idea was no, that? that? That doesn't make sense, nor does it make sense to even go into lunar orbit with a Mars-bound spaceship. Um, the, uh, the propellant required to go from low Earth orbit to uh, lunar orbit is the same as required to go from low Earth orbit onto direct trans-Mars trajectory. So even if there was propellant waiting for you in lunar orbit, let alone on the surface, and available for free, uh, it wouldn't make sense to go there and get it on your way to Mars. So that was uh, always just a make-work program. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's incredible. Now, going to the moon is useful if you want to go to the moon. But the, uh, I mean, it's essential, <laughs> but, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but once again, um, the current Trump moon initiative is um, being severely damaged by um, vendor-driven imperatives as opposed to mission-driven imperatives, building the lunar orbit gateway, which is not needed to go to the moon. I mean, somebody should ask uh, Jim Bridenstine, do you think we could have gotten to the moon faster in Apollo if we had built a gateway? No, of course not. Now, yeah. what about the the number of astronauts that have apparently said they would be willing to take a one way trip to Mars with no intention of ever coming back? If you have those kind of astronauts and colonists, as it were, then you don't need a return craft. That would save money. Well, yeah, uh, and people have proposed that. I mean, from a strictly technical point of view, the one way mission is easier. You don't need all the return technology, and it, in one sense, it's also less risky because you don't have all the flight risk associated with the return flight. But I tend to believe that the first missions to Mars will be round trip missions. Uh, and because you, before you start building a base, you want to know you've chosen the right place. <laughs> so we should explore a number of localities before we choose the place that we're really going to build up on. And you want to set up some of these uh, capabilities. Uh, lots of greenhouses have lots of habs going. So a number of round trip missions. But ultimately, look, I mean, life's a one way trip. So uh, we're all on a one-way trip to somewhere. That's and, true. And um, so the idea of a one-way trips to Mars is not intrinsically uh, crazy. It's just um, something that has to come in its time. 
Now, what about the atmosphere of Mars? There's, you, you have to wear a spacesuit all the time. You have some discussion of, of altering the planet, but that would take thousands of years, presumably. Is there a, a shortcut around that? Well, okay, the initial people that go to Mars will build land in their habitat craft. And, of course, in there you won't need a spacesuit. You'll have an atmosphere. Going outside, you will need uh, a spacesuit. Yeah, sure. Uh, now, we'll want to build large pressurized volumes on Mars. Um, there's two places to do it, above ground and underground. Uh, the um, Now, one could create vaults underground on Mars. Those would be extremely well shielded from any cosmic radiation, and they're advantageous for that point of view. Um for human residents, but I think we'll also want to have uh, domes on the surface of Mars that are transparent, which is where we'll grow the plants. You want to use natural sunlight to grow plants. Um, people who think you can grow the plants with electricity uh, do not reckon with the power requirements. Do you realize mm -hmm. if you wanted to grow all the plants that they grow in Rhode Island, which is, or they have some farms, but it's not ordinarily thought of as an agricultural giant. <laughs> and you had to do it with artificial light. It would take more electricity than the entire human race currently produces. Oh, okay. So solar energy has its downsides, but it's really good for outdoor lighting in the daytime. And, um, and it's really good for growing plants. And one tremendous advantage of Mars over the moon, for example, in addition to the fact that it has copious amounts of carbon dioxide and water, which is what you need to grow plants, is that the atmosphere, as thin as it is, is thick enough to mask out solar flares, yeah. which means that the only radiation dose that the plants would get growing on the surface are this very uh, uh, gradual cosmic ray radiation, which is, is not going to affect the plants uh, in their growing season of a year or less or, or whatever. Uh, and so you could therefore grow plants in thin-walled greenhouses on the surface. On the moon, you would need to have a glass at least five inches thick to shield them against solar flares, which is why people talk about growing with artificial light. But then there's the power requirement, mm. um, as well as the water requirements and the carbon requirement. Uh, we are carbon-based life forms, after all. Carbon comes in really handy if you want to build a civilization. Now, what about the ra um, radiation of the astronauts on the way to Mars? Uh, this is overdrawn. Um, okay, the radiation uh, dose rate on the way to Mars, um, provided you have a onboard shelter against solar flares, which are large occasional events of, of uh, uh, megavolt uh, protons that come out of the sun, uh, but you can shield against them with like five inches of food and water and other things of that nature, uh, provided you can shield against that, which you can with your provisions, uh, the cosmic ray dose in interplanetary space is only a factor of two more than what it is at the space station. So, in fact, uh, there's now over a dozen astronauts and cosmonauts because they have done long duration stays on the space station who have gotten a cumulative cosmic ray dose uh, uh, comparable to what they would have gotten going to Mars and back. And we see no radiological casualties among this group at all, nor would we expect there to be any because based on conservative estimates, the radiation dose involved is about a 1% risk of, of cancer at some point later in your life. Mm. And if you've got 12 people, each have had a 1% risk, chances are no, no casualties. The, actually, the real serious health danger on the way to Mars isn't radiation at all. It's zero gravity, mm. and um, which does cause uh, uh, damage to human physiology and deterioration of muscle and bone. Um, and unfortunately, since the NASA space medicine community is dominated by by zero gravity health effects researchers, um, they have devoted no um, um, attention to this. Well, the ex um, the exercise but, program would work, wouldn't it? You, you, well, have a stationary, you have a stationary bike or you have one of those running treadmills with straps that hold you down, and that would m maintain muscle and bone. Well, it does. Among those, uh, like, for instance, Shannon Lucid was the first to really show this. Uh, that really take it seriously and do two hours a, a workout a day. A lot of the astronauts and cosmonauts don't. And so I prefer to rotate the spacecraft and create artificial gravity. Mm. Oh, so on the way there, you would have one of these 2001 type rotating uh, habitats. Where well, what I would do actually is you got the habitat and you got the upper stage that launched it to Mars. 
So they're both going to Mars. Okay. So what you do is you take the habitat and you tether off the upper stage, which is now uh, empty of, of propellant. It's no longer a useful item except as a counterweight. And you spin this assembly up, habitat, tether, uh, tether, upper stage. You spin this up and you could create a Mars gravity in the hab if you rotated it, say, at a one revolution per minute, Earth gravity at a little less than two revolutions per minute, that kind of thing. I think we could test this. And one of the things I would like to do with the Orion capsule, which is um, rather overweight for its purpose of taking astronauts to lunar orbit, it, its difficulties, but it is ideal for long-term orbit, tethering off the upper stage of the booster with some astronauts in it, spinning that up, and you can have a little artificial gravity space station in which we could learn uh, the effects of artificial gravity. We could learn what long duration exposure to partial gravity does to you. Um, that would be a good for Orion. So Orion is the NASA program, right? Yeah, uh, Orion um, is the capsule that uh, NASA is contracted with Lockheed Martin to build. They've spent 15 years on it now. It hasn't flown yet. That compares to five years for developing the Apollo capsule, which it's really simply an enlarged version of. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, unlike the Apollo capsule, which with its service module weighed nine tons, this weighs 26. Wow. And so it's so heavy that even the SLS, the heavy lift booster that NASA is trying to develop, cannot deliver it to low lunar orbit with enough propellant for home. And that's one of the reasons why they want to build this lunar orbit gateway, a kind of a halfway house space station in high lunar orbit where you could get there with an SLS and an Orion, although not with a lunar lander as well. So you're left stuck in the, um, the gateway station unless you have another SLS that delivers you a lander. Uh, in contrast, uh, okay, uh, the Dragon with its service module weighs 10 tons, only a little more than the Apollo did, and it's half again as big as the Apollo capsule. So slightly more weight, but much bigger size. It is smaller than Orion, but only a little more than one third is heavy. And uh, with it, yeah, SLS could deliver it to low lunar orbit with enough propellant to come home and a lander. Or the Falcon Heavy, which is already flying, the SpaceX uh, semi-heavy launch vehicle could deliver it into low lunar orbit with enough propellant to uh, come home. And that costs less than one tenth of what an SLS costs. So the problem here with the NASA Lunar Initiative is that um, they're not taking advantage of the entrepreneurial space revolution. They have cheaper alternatives that are available to them. If Mike Pence was serious about landing humans on the moon by 2024, he would take advantage of the capabilities that are available now, okay, and which are cheaper. Um, so why not? And, and which therefore don't require a whole, whole gateway project, which is going to make his dream impossible. Uh, and so uh, the problem here is if you want to have a free market, you have to not just have free suppliers, you have to have free customers. <laughs> and if the NASA human spaceflight program is a vendor controlled customer, okay, mm. where it's not free to make decisions based on cost effectiveness, uh, that uh, makes the cheaper alternatives um, uh, useless to it. The science program, which is purpose-driven, had no hesitation about choosing the Falcon 9 to launch the test space telescope. They saved themselves $200 million. Hmm. Um, but that's the difference. That, you know, a lot of people point to how much more the science program has accomplished than the human spaceflight program in the years since Apollo. Mm -hmm. And they think it is because the robots and so forth are cheaper than launching people and, and what have you. But I don't think that's the fundamental reason. I think that the reason why the science program has accomplished more is because it's been purpose driven. Okay. We didn't land rovers on Mars to give business to airbag companies. We <laughs> right. came up with the idea of a rover mission, and the engineers came up with that as the optimal solution, and therefore that's what was chosen. Okay, what we have now in the human spaceflight program is as if 
you know, when Kennedy said, I want to go to the moon, someone said to him, well, we have this X-15 program and you're welcome to go to the moon, provided you use the X-15 program. But if you don't use that, you're not going to the moon. <laughs> and he would, uh, you know, and, and if he submitted to that. But in any space venture, you always have people who tell you, you can't do your program until you do my program. Mm -hmm. And, and um, the human spaceflight program has to be liberated from that. And if, if, it, if it is, then yes, they could achieve humans to the 2024. And with Starship flying by 2024, humans to Mars by the end of the decade. All right, let's fast forward. It's 2030 or make it 2040 or 2050 if you want. We have a colony on Mars that's growing. Uh, let's talk for a moment about uh, the governing of Mars, Mars governance. Uh, what would you take in, in, in terms of like constitutions or, or Bill of Rights? Or what if, what if whoever runs it gains control of the oxygen and water and becomes a, a, a tyrant? All right. Well, there's, there's two uh, questions here. Um, I'll answer them in turn. Okay. People sometimes ask me, what would be the best government for Mars? Uh, and I say, is the, I'm not going to specify a government for Mars. There will be different groups of people that go to Mars, and they'll have different ideas on how uh, the best government should be and what forms of government will maximize uh, uh, human potential and, and opportunity and, and uh, to exercise talent and, and so forth. And, um, and in fact, I think this will be a major driver for Mars colonization, that there will be groups of people who have novel ideas in these respects and in general will not be popular um, among everyone else because they have different ideas. And they'll need a place where they can go where they can give these ideas a spin. And the ones that do work, work better, <coughs> natural selection, okay, the ones that do work better will draw immigrants everyone else. The ones whose ideas are impractical will fade and, and, and we won't hear more from them. The founders of the United States embraced the ideas of 18th century liberalism, enlightenment liberalism, which were not unknown in Europe, but due to the power structures there could not be uh, really given a try, that they embraced it and um, gave it a try. They called it a noble experiment mm -hmm. and it worked. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but it worked better than what had existed before. It worked so well that millions of people voted with their feet to come here and the place grew and it prospered and the rest is history. Um, the, 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 so that's my answer to that one. Well, but, um, but, but, but wait, now, so, so, so if, if you're living on the East Coast and you don't like what the federal government's doing, you just go west to Utah, which is just a territory, and you start your own, your own new uh, country or state or whatever. You can't do that on Mars because there's no air or water. You can, there's no food on the hoof and so forth. Well, uh, I, there wasn't much in the Great Salt Lake either. And <laughs> frankly— uh, That's no, true. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, um, the early Mars colonists will have it much easier than the pilgrims did coming to Massachusetts or the Mormons did going to Utah or um, um, the Jews did going to Palestine to take three examples of hmm. rather improbable uh, colonization efforts that were motivated largely by transcendent ideas that we want to have our own place where we can create our own world. Uh, and then you figure out how you can survive there um, and prosper there. Um, but look, there were many uh, experimental colonies in the new world. There was theocratic ones in Paraguay and so forth uh, that either died out or <laughs> certainly didn't prosper very much and did not become a model for anyone. Uh, and so now, um, this is the, the question of how can one create a Mars colony, uh, is, uh, it's a different question. Okay. But you asked the question of what kind of government will they, could they have? And my answer is Mars won't be a utopia. It'll be a lab. Okay. It'll be a place where experiments are done. Now, in terms of um, the second thing you mentioned, uh, um, which was how could there be extraterrestrial liberty given that a government could turn your air off? 
Okay. Uh, if you look at human history, the easiest people for a tyrant to oppress are allegedly self-sufficient peasants. Okay. Because none of them are essential. There's a medieval saying, city air makes the man free. It is the more complex interrelationships of a society that makes each individual more important. Okay, a Mars colony or a space colony in general, uh, a single individual could sabotage the whole place. So the government's going to have to treat people right. Extraterrestrial tyranny is impossible because of these, uh, because the citizens are empowered. Okay, um, specialization actually leads to empowerment uh, of individuals. If everyone's the same, no one's essential. Okay. Now, to your third question, which is, how could you have a Mars colony at all? I mean, sure, okay, we get cheaper launch vehicles and so forth, and now a humans to Mars mission by the U.S. government becomes affordable, so they'll do it, and they'll even maybe have a permanent Mars base. But how can we actually have a settlement with an economy that Mm -hmm. supports itself mm -hmm. okay now um the way i think it, it it'll work like this first of all the following conditions need to apply number one cheap space launch we're getting there number two the ability to turn martian materials into resources so that not only is it cheaper to send stuff there we need to send much less stuff there but even so you'd be right in saying There'll be need for some imports. They won't have to import food. They won't have to import steel, but they may have to import, you know, uh, sophisticated electronics or something like this. How are they going to pay for it? Okay. Uh, I believe that uh, while there's some material products that you can name, um, you know, deuterium, whatever, that have high value that you can transport back to Earth. I think the most probable export from Mars or any other space colony are intellectual products, things that can be transmitted. And what I would say is um, a Mars colony is likely to be a group of technologically adept people in a frontier environment where they are forced to innovate and where they are free to innovate. And the inventions they make will be patentable on Earth and can be licensed on Earth. And that's how they'll generate their income. There's nothing cheaper to transport across an interplanetary distance than a patent. <laughs> um, and, you know, um, colonial and 19th century America, uh, we created a culture of invention. The frontier became a driver for invention. And uh, Yankee ingenuity became a, uh, a stereotype. Uh, and the and because we had in 19th century America a severe labor shortage, and in part we tried to remedy this with uh, encouraging immigration, uh, but also with a labor-saving machinery, um, and with no respect whatsoever for old ways of doing things. Um, you know, the the characteristic American philosophy is pragmatism. If it works, do it. That's now how it's done before. Forget it. This will work. Um, the, the, uh, so this influenced American culture in any number of ways, but it also created this culture of invention, um, which is even one American stereotype running from Edison, I mean, Franklin to Edison, to the Wright brothers and, and, and so forth. Uh, the, 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 and a Mars colony, okay, with its severe labor shortage, Yes, they're going to want labor-saving machinery. They're going to want robotics. They're going to want artificial intelligence, uh, and all this in order to maximize the volume and diversity of work that can be done with a limited population. Uh, they're going to want ultra-productive crops. Okay, genetically modified organisms is going to be a big thing on Mars. Okay, and nobody is going to take any stuff from people warning about the dangers of killer tomatoes getting loose in the colony and all this. The, the, because in other words, if you're doing greenhouse agriculture, you're, you're going to want absolute maximum productivity per square meter uh, to, to an extent that is simply uh, not being forced on Earth. So, uh, and then power. Okay, deuterium is five times more common in hydrogen on Mars than on Earth. So there'll be a, a, a driver for fusion power. 
that you don't see here. I mean, on Earth, you can make power with waterfalls and windmills and natural gas and coal and whatever. Uh, but even solar power on Mars is only 40 percent as, as uh, uh, forceful as it is on Earth. So, uh, you know, you're driven in this direction. Well, fusion reactors, they'll be licensable on Earth for sure. Uh, so necessity is a driver for invention. And uh, I think you'll have an extremely pragmatic culture and one dedicated to invention because it'll have to be. And that's how they can afford it. And if if I was writing a science fiction novel, <laughs> I think you could create a, a plausible scenario where the inventor, the visionary goes to Silicon Valley and he gets all the rich guys in the room and he says, here's the plan. Put up the money. We'll recruit a thousand humanity, space bearing civils, we'll send them to Mars and they will be of pressure cutcher and that's how you're going to get your investment back. And while that business plan is not sound today, I believe that business plan will be sound 30 years from now. Well, some of those uh, uh, VC uh, investors, they, they don't plan for just the next quarter. They do project out decades, uh, or at least a decade yeah. anyway. So, Okay, so we've uh, colonized Mars, say, by 2030. What date would you put for it to be self-sustaining where if there was a nuclear war on Earth or we just quit uh, sending spaceships to Mars, they'd be self-sustaining? Well, I don't know. That could be quite far out. Look, uh, no country on Earth is autarkic. Uh, even North Korea, which is the most autarkic country on Earth, it suffers greatly because it has chosen that path. Okay. So uh, I do not agree with people who view Mars as the lifeboat. That is, if Earth is destroyed, at least we'll have some survivors. We're going to Mars so that if Earth is hit by an asteroid, there'll be some survivors. Right. Uh, or, you know, we're going to Mars, among other reasons, so we'll become a spacefaring species that we can deflect asteroids. Okay, which is, I mean, look, you know, the Earth is in space, okay, and things in space fly around and they collide with each other. And if we want to be able to control the flight traffic here, we have to get out uh, uh, and have freedom to move in space so that we can give things nudges and prevent such impacts. So it's together to Mars and then together with Mars. What we're going to do with Mars is we're going to add a new branch or perhaps several new branches of human civilization, which will be quite inventive and quite productive and which will uh, make humanity more potent to deal with whatever menaces it might face, be they asteroids or new diseases or, or, or anything. And also, uh, as far as war is concerned, uh, and I discuss this in the book and in, in one of the final chapters, uh, I believe that, well, first of all, I believe that war is the major threat to humanity. Uh, it's a much more immediate threat than things like resource exhaustion and final climate change or or any or asteroids even for that matter. I mean, and the, what causes what caused the great disastrous wars of the 20th century? Bad ideas. And in particular, one bad idea, which is that there isn't enough to go around. OK, or there might be enough to go around now, but sooner or later, there isn't going to be enough to go around. And therefore, sooner or later, we're going to have to have it out with those people over there. OK, like Germany looking at Russia in 1914 and saying, we're going to have to have it out with them sooner or later. Better sooner before they industrialize. OK, and Hitler basically coming to the same calculation uh, a generation later. OK, and. But we have to refute that. And by making humanity interplanetary, we make it clear that that's fundamentally untrue, that there isn't just what you see here, because the Earth comes with an infinite sky. And if we open up that sky, if we're creating new civilizations on new worlds, it, it's quite clear that uh, human beings are not consumers of resources. We are creators of resources. We're creating... Uh, new child civilizations, which are going to add to the strength of humanity as a whole. Um, and we're really showing what humans can do when instead of tearing each other apart, we work together to open up broader prospects. I agreed with your analysis in the book um, of the importance of the frontier. And you start off with Frederick Jackson Turner's famous paper about the closing of the Western frontier of the United States. Um, 
But if we never go to Mars, it doesn't mean that Earth will eventually hit its carrying capacity, mainly because for your own arguments that human ingenuity and resourcefulness does not depend on a finite limited number of resources because we just create new forms of resources. We'll get electricity from some other source, if not fossil fuels and, and so forth. And that we're, that whole Malthusian argument, it can be countered without having to have space as a final frontier. Well, it can be, but it hasn't been. I mean, from a rational point of view, you're absolutely correct. And by the way, the term carrying capacity, I, I find extremely <clears throat> objectionable. The earth is not carrying us. People are not a burden being carried by the earth. Okay. <laughs> you know, the, the, the people are carrying the human race. Okay. Uh, we're carrying ourselves. Uh, we, you know, we, but look, it, it's absolutely correct. I mean, but just think about this. 1914, humanity was never richer. Mm -hmm. Was never richer. Okay. Uh, a hundred years before that, there was starvation in the capitals of major cities like London and Paris. That's the world described by Victor Hugo and Charles Dickens, where people are starving to death in the streets of London and Paris. The characters in, in, in uh, Les Mis, you know, have to deal with the very real prospect that they could die of starvation. Okay, that's no longer the case in 1914 in Europe. And yet, and yet, they think they're running out of resources. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you know, in Hitler, um, you know, the laws of existence require uninterrupted killing so that the better may live. Uh, Germany needs living space. It's all nonsense. Yeah, that social nonsense. Darwinism. Germany is, is uh, smaller than the Third Reich. It has a much higher standard of living with a higher population. It was all in their heads. Okay. But this is in people's heads now. I mean, look, I happen to know because I have talked with them that there are people sitting in little cubicles in Washington, D.C., and some big cubicles and also offices with windows that think that war with China is inevitable because if the Chinese, with their 1.3 billion people, four times our population, should develop so that they all have cars like us, there won't be enough oil in the world. And you can bet your bottom dollar that there are people in Beijing who look at this from the other side of the chessboard and think exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the question becomes when, when, and to one side or the other, sooner or later it becomes apparent that sooner is better than later. So okay. this is uh, your, and, this is the argument that a non zero sum game model is a bad idea. Or yeah, this, sorry, a, sorry. The zero sum is the bad idea. Is, is, a, is a, a fatal idea. It's a yeah. fatal conceit. And it's a very dangerous one. And and the problem is, is even though it's refuted by human history, I mean, look, so the population of the world has gone up. And I have a graph in the book that shows this. OK, you know, when Malthus wrote 200 years ago, it was one billion people in the world. The average per capita income in today's uh, dollars is one hundred and eighty dollars a year. Now it's nine thousand. In America, it's much higher than that. But globally, yeah. nine thousand. Nope. Yeah, there's your it, graph. Yeah, there it is. Okay, it's up by a factor. The population's up by a factor of seven. The per capita income is up by a factor of fifty. So the Malthusian theory could not be more counterfactual. Okay, and and yet, you know, we had the Club of Rome, in 1972. They issued this very authoritative-sounding report saying that we we're going to run out of everything by the year 2000, unless he put severe limits on economic growth and population growth and so forth. And um, while they received great acclaim in many uh, parts of the press, none of their predictions came true. Okay, fine. They didn't come true. But you know what? A few years after the year 2000, I forget the exact year, but in the first decade of this century, um, they had a reunion. And, and, uh, and they met together and they said, a lot of people think we were wrong because none of our predictions came true. But we were right. We must be right. I mean, fundamentally, uh, you know, OK, so they discovered some extra oil here or this or that. But fundamentally, there's only so much here. And sooner or later, it's going to run out. And they use that as this point of logic to try, well, and ultimately, people believe this. And there's these books being published with titles like Resource Wars, Destined mm -hmm. for War, so forth and so on. And it has to be refuted. 
And the thing about space, it's like, you know, if you have a line segment, there's an infinite number of points in a line segment. Okay, so you're going to never run out of points within a line segment, and that's kind of like technological progress on Earth. <laughs> but to make the infinity truly visible, you take the limits off the line segment, and everyone can see that it's unlimited because it goes off indefinitely in all directions. Okay, and, and that's the point here about this. Yeah. All right. So uh, we've colonized Mars. At some point, it's relatively self-sustaining. Maybe it doesn't have to be, but it, it, at some point, it probably will. So then we migrate out to what? The, plant, the moons of Saturn and Jupiter? And how do we become a type two and then a type three civilization to the stars? Well, the same technologies that allow you to colonize Mars will also allow you to um, travel to, well, of course, the moon, but the asteroids, including the main belt, uh, and even uh, to the moons of the outer planets. Um, I mean, we can go to Mars now. The spacecraft we have now will get you there in six months, okay? Uh, and that's, that's good enough. That's how long it took to sail to Australia in the 1800s. Um, and fine, okay. But... Once we're on Mars, that will be a driver for the advancement of interplanetary transport. Um, you know, it's like Columbus sailed the Atlantic in ships that even 50 years later, no one would have attempted to sail the Atlantic in. Because in Columbus's day, there weren't Atlantic class ships being built. Okay, but once Europeans became transatlantic, then you had your three master caravels, and then your frigates and clipper ships, and then steamboats and ocean liners and Boeing 747s. So the grandchildren of the first Mars colonists will listen with wonders to the tales of their immigrant uh, grandparents uh, who came over in six-month voyages in cramped little uh, uh, stinky spacecraft. Um, you know, just like many of us have heard the stories of our immigrants who came over in the early 20th uh, century um, on tramp steamers and, and so on. And we now do it on airliners in comfort in a few hours. Um, the uh, But because they will do the trip in three weeks on fusion-powered spacecraft. Hmm. And those kinds of things that make traveling to Mars a matter of routine and ease will make uh, traveling to the outer solar system possible, okay, for people willing to rough it a bit. Um, and ultimately, um, I believe the stars. Now, there is something here, okay, I mean, first of all, as an engineer or applied physicist, if you will, I'm not a theoretical physicist, I know a lot of applied science, um, the, the most potent means of space travel that I can think of are fusion reactors. Okay, with a fusion-powered rocket, you could get exhaust velocities of 7% the speed of light. Uh, a well-designed rocket can get up to about twice its exhaust velocity, so you can get above 10% the speed of light which means Alpha Centauri in 40 years, which may be how we go. But I think there's more to be discovered, okay? And I think that we have a lot to learn, uh, that we have read the first chapter, maybe two of the Book of Nature, but there's at least uh, 10 more chapters to be read. And uh, certainly by becoming spacefaring, we're gonna facilitate that because you know, most of the great discoveries in physics were made through astronomy, okay? Um, gravity and classical physics were discovered through astronomy. Um, you know, a lot of electromagnetism was basically through astronomy. Certainly relativity was discovered through astronomy. Nuclear fusion was discovered through astronomy. Um, the, you know, black holes, of course, were discovered through astronomy. Uh, and, and so on. And because uh, the universe is a, a gigantic laboratory the, dwarfing anything we could build or hope to build. And when we become spacefaring, we're going to be launching giant observatories that you know, make Hubble look like Galileo's first telescope by comparison. We're going to discover, uh, I believe, as yet unperceived laws of physics. Okay. I think that there's a lot remaining to be discovered. And I discuss this in the book, okay, because you, know, you go, especially me as an engineer, you go to university and they say, these are the laws of physics, here it is. So oh, that's great, I can send electromagnetic waves, I can plot trajectories, I can do all sorts of stuff, it's very useful. But why is there charge? Why is there mass? 
Why don't electrons blow themselves to pieces because they are their own charge and they should repel themselves into nothing? Okay, you know, why, why, why? You can ask all these things. Why are the laws of the universe conducive to life? Uh, there are things that are, are shaping the laws of physics that we don't know about. And I'm not trying to be mystical here. I'm saying these are scientific questions, okay? And they have scientific answers. So these are and different from how like, these are different from how questions. You want to know why yeah. the the universe has certain why the gra the the laws of gravity are the way they are, or the relationship between electromagnetism and gravity, and so forth. And if we could right. fi if we could figure that out, the why there might be some technological implications of that. Right. I'm to take a, an example that's out of your ball court. Okay. <clears throat> there once was a time when um, the um, superb organization of organisms was thought of as evidence of supernatural intervention into nature. Okay. Now, the theory of evolution um, disproved that as being required, but it did more than uh, make some unhappy uh, priests. Uh, it gave us a tool for understanding biology. That has led to enormous advances in medicine and agriculture and all sorts of things. Uh, so it's if you can explain something, then you know uh, it gives you powers over nature as well. Um, and if we could explain why some of these things are the way they are, I'm sure there's additional powers over nature that are waiting to be unleashed. You have an interesting discussion on um, as, a, as a little bit of a sidebar here, but the assuming we become interstellar, would we not eventually encounter other extraterrestrial intelligences who would have figured out everything you've just described? And if they were only ahead of us by, say, a million years or even 100,000 years, and, and assuming the Copernican principle that we're not special, half of them should be before us and half of them will come after us. We should have encountered them by now. What's your answer to the Fermi paradox of where is everybody? Well, um, uh, the, the, I don't have a clear answer for that. Uh, I, I will say I, I do have an answer, uh, which I do discuss in the book, as to why the SETI people have not discovered uh, extraterrestrial radio signals. And this comes right out of uh, engineering calculations, which is that um, it would take uh, gigawatts of power uh, directed with very large dishes at us to create any kind of a reasonable data transmission rate. Uh, and, you know, the Earth, uh, okay, extraterrestrial astronomers would have detected our oxygen signal of, that would show uh, uh, an active biosphere here. Any time for the past 400 million years since plants came out on land, there was plenty of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. So somebody could have checked, said, oh, there's a planet that's got life, let's send them a radio signal. And they did it, you know, between 300 million years ago and, and, and 240 million years ago and then gave up. Okay, because, you know, in other words, it, it's not um, a useful form of, of interstellar communication. Hmm. Um, so um, I do think that... <laughs> Sending genetic messages across space uh, is a more practical way to communicate, uh, especially since if you're communicating with people you don't know, and if your main goal of, of communicating with people you don't know is propaganda, okay, and the message of propaganda is always be like us. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, uh, so. Yeah, you had that great discussion of the uh, of little capsules that have yes. the DNA of all organisms on Earth or whatever, and you could launch those into space for pretty cheap. And, that, yes. and, that, and, that, and that's something, and that's something look, we could do. Is, yeah. All right. And, well, look, there is a mystery associated with life on Earth, which is that we find no free living organisms on Earth that are simpler than bacteria. Mm -hmm. And bacteria are by no means simple. They have all kinds of organelles, and they have... Uh, well, just to take the most obvious example, a fully articulated language of uh, genetic information, the DNA, RNA, the complete alphabet, okay, and uh, and the same one that we use. Um, but, you know, it's like discovering cavemen using the Latin alphabet, okay, uh, and w which took 
you know, thousands of years to develop. Um, now, because of this, uh, it's been uh, suspected by at least one school of thought that life on Earth could be an immigrant phenomenon. Okay, this goes back to the late 19th century, Arrhenius, uh, panspermia. Now, uh, the particular form of panspermia that he advocated is um, um, probably untrue. It's untrue, okay, because uh, he thought that the universe had no beginning, that it was perpetual, and it, there's all sorts of connections in there. But putting that aside, it's perfectly possible that life on Earth is an immigrant phenomenon, okay? Um, now, and furthermore, um, life did appear on Earth almost immediately after it could, okay? That is, uh, we have fossils of life on Earth going back three and a half billion years, um, and we have things that are arguably uh, biomarkers going back 3.8 billion years, which takes you right to the end of the heavy bombardment before which life on Earth was impossible. So life appears on Earth virtually as soon as it could, which means one of two things. Either, okay, if life did emerge on Earth, it means that it's very easy for life to emerge from chemistry wherever it has a survivable planet. Or alternatively, life was already floating around in space around the Earth, and as soon as Earth became habitable for microbes, they landed and started populating the place. Okay, either way indicates that life is plentiful in the universe. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, if it was, uh, if it did come from the outside, um, then the question is, did it come naturally or was it uh, uh, artificial? Uh, you know, uh, that's uh, uh, difficult to ascertain. Um, if you're just looking at microbes themselves, uh, the simpler hypothesis is that it's natural. Okay, although they would need to get some kinds of protection, but, but they might be able to get that with some suit on them to protect them against uh, ultraviolet and so forth. Like one can envision a natural process that could account for the spread of microbes from one solar system to another. In fact, I, I've written a paper, it's going to be published soon, which discusses um, the probability of close encounters between stars and how that could cause exchange of material between or clouds and, and so forth. And one can envision a natural process. Okay, uh, doing that. But how could you see uh, if it was uh, intelligent? Well, if, if I wanted to send microbes to another solar system, I describe how I would engineer little, what I call micro sailcraft, which would contain groups of spores within something that would give them proper protection against ultraviolet and a tiny little solar sail, a few millimeters in diameter, that would take them to interstellar speeds and also slow them down for reentry. Well, could look for such things, could look for such things in the Earth's stratosphere, but you'd have a confusing signal with all the life being thrown up from the ground on Earth. How about the atmosphere of Venus? How about the atmosphere of Mars? How about the atmosphere of Titan? You could see if, if, if such things are being thrown around. Another thing you could look for, uh, though, is that's looking for the messengers. The other thing you could do is look for the messages. Mm -hmm. Okay, now... Uh, I know you don't like intelligent design, okay. <laughs> yeah. but I'm going to give you an example of how you could discover intelligent design of at least one life form on Earth, mm -hmm. and that is the North American Mustang, okay, because- <laughs> you, mean to, the, well, you mean the horse, not the car. That's right, the horse, <laughs> okay. Uh, the car would also show intelligent design, <laughs> but, but look, to a um, naive biologist that didn't know human history, they might think that the North American Mustang, being well adapted to living in the places where it lives, was an indigenous species that evolved there and it had all these adaptations, okay? And um, so, now of course that, however, is not true. North American Mustang is descended from horses that escaped from the Spanish conquistadors, okay? Mm -hmm. And those horses did not look like the Mustangs of today because they were horses that had been bred for carrying armored knights, mm -hmm. okay? Now, if a geneticist could take a Mustang and look, look at its genes, they might find in those genes uh, a past history of heavy uh, horses, uh, I forget what they're called, uh, but the ones that carried armored knights, Okay, which had no business being in the American Plains. Okay, 
So you would say, aha, this horse is a naturalized, okay, as it were, uh, horse, though in its past, somebody bred it for another purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, there's traits in here that don't belong here. Although okay. here you'd have to distinguish uh, between that and self-domestication. For example, wolves into dogs, nobody did that intentionally. Essentially, it's a form of self-domestication as a, as a way of surviving on the fringes of human habitats. Right. But if you think about this, now, by the way, I'm not saying that this is so, okay? I'm just saying that this yeah, is a I form understand. of investigation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, okay. Some years ago, some scientists took some chick embryos and they activated some dormant genes in its so-called junk DNA. And the chicks were born manifesting dinosaur traits, mm -hmm. and, including teeth. Mm -hmm. All right. So now this is not so astonishing. I mean, it's pretty remarkable, but, but it, it's not mind blowing because you say, well, the birds were once dinosaurs. They once didn't have teeth. And so uh, a record of that past career can be found in the genome of the birds. OK. And similarly, it's been known for since the 19th century, you know, that in embryology, mammal embryos uh, at one point manifest gills and other fish traits. Mm -hmm. OK. And in fact, this is evidence for evolution that they had this previous uh, uh, career um, uh, in evolutionary history. All right. So mammals have fish genes in them. All right. Do fish have mammal genes? <laughs> okay. Uh, now, if you ever found that, okay, and if you could show that that was not a lateral transmission of right, a mammal gene right. into fish from bacteria, which could happen, but, you know, if you say a suggestion for future evolution had been delivered into the biosphere, that would certainly be evidence for extraterrestrial uh, communication of an interesting kind, suggestions for evolution. This, now, is, this is a little so bit like... Again, um... Paul Davies' second genesis uh, uh, thought experiment, right? That, that, that in addition to SETI, we should be looking at fossils on Earth uh, or organisms on Earth that don't have DNA. They have some other form of self-replicating molecules, which would imply a second, a second genesis. Well, no, th that's true, but that's not what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking that uh, if, if, if the most useful form of uh, interstellar communication um, is genetic, is suggestions for evolution, not, hey, here's the plans for building starships. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, okay. Anyway, uh, these are speculations. But okay, okay, let me, think... let me stop you one second. So just to back up a bit, um, either way, it, whether it's intelligently designed panspermia or natural panspermia, either way, there still has to be a natural bottom-up explanation for where the intelligent agents came from in the first place or where the, yeah. the the first step from from chemistry to the earliest life forms that you're calling you know the, the earliest simplest bacteria on earth are still super complex between the start and that and, and where we're we're at there well, sure that had to happen naturally somewhere correct but for example okay um if you are freed from the constraint that the life evolved on Earth, yeah. you can postulate alternative initial conditions. It's like, you know, if, if, if someone said to you, uh, uh, look, we have to assume since there are people in North America that people originated in North America. And you say, well, my theory is that they evolved from higher apes. Say, but there were none in North America ever, <laughs> right. and therefore your theory is wrong. Yeah. Okay. The uh, okay. So I'm, follow I'm following you. So, are you envisioning our sun circling through the galaxy as the galaxy is rotating? We're passing through stellar systems over hundreds of millions of years, and there's some kind of well, cross yes, pollination. As, as a matter of fact, look the uh, the Gaia results of the European Space Telescope show that uh, the sun and basically all the stars. Um, uh, in our neighborhood have, okay, they're, they're going around the center of the galaxy at about 250 kilometers a second, but they have a random velocity with respect to the, uh, each other of about 10 kilometers a second. And then it's a very simple calculation. And I, I present this in, in the paper that's going to post soon. And, but I do refer to it in, in, in general terms in the book that, uh, you do get close stellar encounters, uh, 
every 20 to 30 million years. Mm -hmm. And uh, which interestingly is the rough frequency of mass extinctions on Earth. Mm. Um, a number of years ago, some people thought that the Earth might have, the Sun might have a companion star, which they call Nemesis, on a highly elliptical orbit, taking it through the Oort cloud every 26 million years. That. They couldn't find it. Right. But also, an objection to that theory is that the mass extinctions are not that precisely periodic. Right. I think it's a characteristic <clears throat> frequency not a actual periodic frequency. Uh, but yeah, uh, every 20 or 30 million years, uh, the sun passes through somebody else's or cloud. And um, we probably get bombarded. And they're passing through our or cloud. And we're both bombarded by our own or cloud and by theirs. Now, you have a, well, a, gra a graph on page 268 here of your calculations for... Um, the number of possible number of uh, galactic civilizations and their distribution with L, the length of a civilization, 10,000 years, 50,000 years, 200,000 years, giving us a million or 5 million or 20 million civilizations. This is just in our galaxy. Um, right. But you're, you're, you're assuming L, the length of a civilization, to be any kind of civilization, like let's say from the agricultural revolution to last week here on Earth. But what if L is as I calculated it at 400 years, the length of a nation state that has to fund a spacefaring program or else you're not going to have that. Okay, well, first of all, the L, okay, Frank Drake, uh, who pioneered this field, uh, and Sagan and the, the others, uh, first of all, they defined a civilization as one possessing radio. Okay, right. Okay, all right, because otherwise they're not. Well, okay, but because they were interested in radio detection. Now, that is not a constraint here where you're just saying how many civilizations are there. But, okay, how many advanced civilizations are there? That's as good a criteria as any. Um, but there, there's a problem with the Drake equation, and I have a chapter in the book entitled Mistakes in the Drake Equation. I love that. Okay. I love that chapter. Yeah, it's really interesting. Okay. Because the Drake equation assumes that such a civilization can only arise on a planet once. Mm. Um and um, and this is false. I mean, now, you know, in 1960, when they came up with this, the thing that was on everybody's minds was the probability of nuclear war mm -hmm. in the relatively near term, that this was the constraint on it. But let's say there had been a nuclear war in the 1960s. Well, OK, that would have been a real bad disaster. But 500 years later, civilization would be completely reestablished. OK, so. If you have an event like a nuclear war, that does not set you back to the Earth as it was four billion years ago with no life. Yeah, if you go, if you go to uh, if you go to Nagasaki and Hiroshima today, you'd never know there was a bomb there just fifty years right. ago. Right. No, sorry, and more than even, that. I mean, look, the KT impact that uh, caused the death of the dinosaurs, a few million, which was a vastly more devastating event than a nuclear war. Um, a few million years later, the Earth is completely repopulated with all sorts of interesting new species of large reptiles, mammals, birds, the works. Uh, and uh, so the, I say the reconstruction time for a, our biosphere now is a few million years, not a few billion years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I go through that. And the other thing that is neglected in the Drake equation is the possibility of a civilization once established becoming uh, starfaring and therefore spreading, um, which I, I think is, is, is probable. Now, by the way, I, I do discuss in the book how, what, how I think we're most likely to detect extraterrestrials first. And it's through astronomy. And in particular, and I think we'll, we'll do it within 20 years, because within 20 years, and possibly much sooner than if we build the W first telescope, instead of canceling it, okay, we'll be able to detect oxygen in the atmospheres of extrasolar planets. Now, oxygen is an artifact of life. There was no oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere until we had life here, and there is no oxygen in any other planet in our solar system that lacks an active biosphere, okay? And so, okay, so you can detect oxygen atmospheres uh, on, on planets around other stars. That will tell us about the existence of other biospheres. Well, how will it tell us about the existence of other civilizations? Well, 
if the characteristic spread is, say, one in 30 stars has a planet with oxygen, who has a, a, a biosphere, and that's what we see. But in one particular pocket of the galaxy here, every star has a, a planet with a biosphere. That would tell you that there's a spacefaring species there that's running around terraforming planets. Mm -hmm. And that would be a, a sign of a kind of intelligence. <laughs> a kind of intelligent oh, yeah. design, <laughs> self-intelligent design, as I would call it, I, yeah. I suppose. Well, right. terraform. Yeah, right. So, uh, and and so this takes us to our third stage. Your uh, your typing of civilization is slightly different than Kardashev's. Um, yeah. you, where for you, type three is is just be, be, being an interstellar species, right, or intergalactic. Right. right. Yeah. No, I, I think Kardashev's uh, schema is is not that useful. Uh, His was related to ener energy energy consumption, right? Yeah, well, Kardashev <clears throat> would say that you had to use all the solar energy falling on the Earth before we achieve type 1, which is, um, no, okay, uh, the, you know, we're going to be interstellar before we do that, mm -hmm. um, and, and let alone use all the energy of the sun emitting to the solar system. So... My schema is type one is a civilization with full access and mastery of the resources of its planet, uh, type two of its solar system, type three access to the stars. Right. So that takes us to our third level. How do we get to Alpha Centauri? If you're going at the speed of Voyager, it's going to take you something like 70,000 years to get get there. How do we uh, cross those distances at a at a rate that in a human lifetime you can make it? Well, okay, so as I said, a fusion-powered spacecraft oh, fusion -powered. That's right. yeah, uh, could that. get to order of 10% the speed of light, is this where is you're, 40 years. So this where you're accelerating at 1G so that the, the astronauts are... No, no, you don't have to accelerate at 1G. Uh, that would require a lot of power. Um, but if you're going to get to 10% the speed of light, and you're going to do that in 10 years, then you're accelerating at a hundredth of a G. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, now, but once again, as I say, this is based on the kind of physics I know. Okay. Mm. Um, not the kind of physics that I think uh, will be known a hundred years from now. Um, but knowing what I know, we can do it. But I believe that my design for interstellar mission or for terraforming a planet, for example, um, will be viewed as prescient but quaint by the people who actually do it. It's kind of like the Jules Verne moon mission. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, in 1865, I believe, um, Jules Verne wrote his novel, From the Earth to the Moon. And um, they launched from Florida. It was a crew of three. It was Americans who did it. They orbited the moon in a capsule and landed in the Pacific Ocean and were picked up by a United States Navy warship, all as actually happened 104 years later. <laughs> but how did they do it? With heavy artillery <laughs> as the motive force. Okay, so you read that and you say, how 19th century can you get? Similarly, somebody, you know, living on Tawasetti 200 years from now will say, if they read this book, say, this is something, this person... 20th century engineer is talking about traveling to other stars, <laughs> uh, but doing it with fusion reactors. How 20th century can you get? You know, you know the people living on the terraform Mars, and they read my plan for doing it with greenhouse gases and 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 and, and green plants. How 20th century can you get? Okay, but but nevertheless, um, these are existence proofs. Now, by the way, on the subject of fusion power, there is. Um, something else that I discuss in the book, um, which is what's happening there. Because as a result of the entrepreneurial space revolution, an entrepreneurial revolution has been unleashed in the area of controlled fusion. That is, controlled fusion uh, has stagnated since the 80s. And um, and people have kind of like thrown up their hands, oh my God, this is always going to be in the future. But the success of SpaceX caused a number of people to rethink it. They say, 
Maybe this is like the problem of a reusable space launch. Maybe this is not fundamentally a technical problem. Maybe it's an institutional problem. Mm -hmm. And so there's fusion power startups that are getting very serious investment, $100 million, $200 million, try Alpha Energy Fusion. Uh, California Fusion Startups got $500 million in investment. That's more than the U.S. government fusion program. The, 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 and, you know, I actually worked in the fusion program a bit in the 80s. And I can remember a group lunch we had at Los Alamos in which the group leader said to us, you know, you know, when fusion powers finally develop, it's not going to be at a place like Los Alamos or Livermore. It's going to be a couple of crackpots working in a garage. And we all laughed. Ha, 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 <laughs> right. OK, but while I think he may have been a bit over the top with that, I don't think it's going to be a couple of crackpots in a garage. I think it will be a startup working in a warehouse. Mm hmm. I remember that interview Bill Gates gave in, it was like 1997 or so when they asked him if he's worried about IBM or whatever. And he said, no, I'm worried about, there's probably a couple of guys in a garage somewhere in Silicon Valley that's going to come up with something I can't think of. And of course, two years later, Google gets its IPO. <laughs> Maybe right. he knew about that already. But yeah, I mean, this is the problem with projecting in the future centuries. I mean, it's just laughable what will, what will turn out to not be true or that we can't even think of. I mean, just say in the 80s, projecting out to where we are now, most people wouldn't have thought of the way the world is structured now with uh, the d digital age. Right. By the way, Charles Fishman's new book, uh, which I just read also along with your book on uh, Apollo, uh, One Giant Leap, it's called, A History of That. He makes the case that, you know, forget all this stuff of what, what did we get out of the Apollo mission? Oh, we got Velcro and Tang. You know, forget that. We got the digital revolution. Now, it probably would have happened anyway, but let's give credit where credit is due. You know, NASA and a government-sponsored program contracting with uh, companies like um, uh, Fairchild to make smaller transistors and so forth, integrated circuits. That's what the, that's the world we live in now. That's largely due to the NASA moonshot program. Uh, whatever sure, and solar energy was basically made a reality by uh, the space program and its hmm. needs. Uh, but I think that the big, if, if you're looking for the concrete near-term payoff of these things, uh, I think more than the actual technological spin-offs that are, are identifiable, uh, it's the intellectual capital. Mm -hmm. You know, we doubled the number of science graduates in this country at the high school and college level um, during the Apollo period, and we tripled it at the PhD level. Um, because, and of course, I was one of those. I was uh, one of Apollo's children. Mm -hmm. And uh, Apollo said to all of us, this is the great adventure. Science is the great adventure. And youth loves adventure. And so, you know, there were millions of us, you know, you know, making rocket fuel and building robots in the basements in the 1960s to the great distress of our parents and so on. <laughs> but, okay, I'm a little unusual out of that cohort and that I actually ended up working on space. But who are the rest of them? They went off and built Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Okay, the 40-year-old technological entrepreneurs of the 1990s who created the computer revolution, the internet revolution, all that, were the 10 and 12-year-old little boy mad scientists of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And if we had a humans to Mars program today, I think its impact would be far greater because um, to take one obvious example is that um, there would be little girl mad scientists too, uh, which there really weren't in the city. Right. So, I mean, both professions are, are open to girls fully, and uh, and of course minorities as well. And the the uh, in a way that simply was just not the case in in, in the 1960s. And so the the social impact of this uh, on education, uh, you know. I mentioned I had been a teacher, and I, I was for seven years. And I taught at schools of various qualities. I taught at some horrible schools, some elite schools, in between schools. And one thing, the, the big takeaway I got from that experience is this. Anybody can teach kids who want to learn. Nobody can teach kids who don't want to learn. Mm. Okay, And it doesn't matter how good your classroom equipment is or any of that. It's, right. it's in the kids. Right. That determines your success. And if you've got kids that want to learn, that are enthusiastic for it, they will learn. We're not going to, you know, fix our STEM education problem in this country by testing the kids to death with the batteries of standardized tests. This is <laughs> complete nonsense, and, and it's, in fact, counterproductive. But 
to have a, a, a program where we are embracing this challenge where, you know, learn your science and you could be pioneering new worlds. Okay, that's how we're going to remedy this problem. I love that. Robert, we've been going for an hour and a half. I just want to pull back at the, uh, look at the bigger picture for just a few minutes. You know, you speak like uh, Carl Sagan does, sort of inspirational. You're also very optimistic in a way that, or at least realistically optimistic in a way that Steve Pinker and I are about pro human progress. It's not inevitable, but it seems to be built in our species that we like to accumulate knowledge and, and solve problems. Uh, in Steve's latest book, Enlightenment Now, he, he starts off with David Deutsch's book on infinity and that uh, I, I thought, like both of those books. Yeah, I, well, I thought those of my I, favorite books. I thought of Deutsch like when it. I was reading your book because you know he he, he basically says it isn't resources; it's knowledge. And the, and, mm -hmm. and Pinker picks up on this. And, and, you know, progress comes from solving problems. It's it's just mm -hmm. problem solving. There's nothing inherent in human history that we're driven to make progress. It comes from each of us trying to do something to make the world a little bit better place for myself, for you, for society, whatever, by solving very specific problems. And, and, and in that sense, knowledge, problem solving is infinite. There's, there's always going to be problems, and, and, and we have a great capacity to solve problems, which is what science and technology does best. So in that sense, I think you know, the case for space is really a case for science, technology, education, reason, critical thinking, and, and all freedom. that. And freedom. And free yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. The freedom okay. to try things, the freedom and, to experiment. Okay. You know, um, if we're coming close to the close, I'd like to read one little section yeah, from the book. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, this is from page 317, um, the year 2069, and begins by, you know, this is 50 years after Apollo. Where are we going to be 50 years from now? Okay. And... Uh, uh, as I write these lines, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing is coming into view. Over the past 50 years, our robotic planetary program has performed epic deeds of exploration, while our human spaceflight effort has stagnated. But now, with the entrepreneurial space revolution, we are poised to break out into the solar system. If we seize this opportunity, where might we be 50 years hence? Here's my vision of where we could be. We will have fusion power and open sea mariculture and will no longer be living in fear of climate change, resource exhaustion, or each other. We will be a cosmopolitan civilization able to travel the globe freely through suborbital space in less than an hour so that nearly everyone will have friends in every land. We will have research laboratories, industries, and hotels on orbit. We will have scientific bases, astronomical interferometers, and helium-3 mines on the moon. There will be operational lunar skyhooks, enabling transport all over the moon and the cheap lifting of propellant to lunar orbit to support exploration missions to the outer solar system. We'll have city-states on Mars, vibrant, optimistic centers of invention, sporting lively and novel cultures, with many casting off the chains of tradition to strike out new paths to show the way to a better future. We will have mining and settlement outfits finding their way into the main asteroid belt and exploration expeditions to the outer solar system to test the means by which we might access its enormous energy resources for the human future. We will have grand observatories floating in free space that will make magnificent discoveries in physics and cosmology, mapping the planets of millions of stars and finding other worlds filled with life and intelligence. We'll be learning the truth about the nature of the universe and life's role in it and preparing our first interstellar spaceships to journey forth and find our place among the stars. That's where I think we could be if we seize this opportunity. I think we are living at the beginning of history, not the end of history. I'll be 115 years old if that happens in, in 20, uh, 2069. I, I hope you're right, and I hope I get to see it, <laughs> and you too. Okay. <laughs> but we'll have, to solve right. a, we'll have to solve a few other biological a aging problems to make that. But certainly the future, I think, is there for our children and our children's children and so on. And by the way, I should point out to readers that, that that's not the end of your book. You, you go to the year 3000 and beyond. Uh, right. and, and, and that's what makes it so, um, inspirational. Even if you're completely wrong about what the end looks like at that date, it's the getting there that's going to be so interesting and all the problems that are solved and all the spinoffs from that, that will improve human society and flourishing for more people in more places. Robert Zubrin, The Case for Space, I think you've made it as good as anybody can. Thank you so much. Thank you.